Japanese Consulate, Honolulu, Tuesday, December 2nd, 1941. Japanese spy Takeo Yoshikawa senses war closing in. A delegation of Japanese specialists had come to survey Pearl Harbor, leaving him a list of questions. And he found the answers to them via observation, gossip, and local media reports. But now, a message comes from Tokyo, ordering him to report daily what ships are in port, whether the harbor has barrage balloons, if there are any anti-torpedo nets. Yes, his mission is definitely nearing its end. He even passed some espionage duties to a German-American agent loyal to Nazi Germany. Still, each day he listens to the weather report on Radio Tokyo, waiting to hear the specific words, East Wind, Rain. The coded message that meant Japan was at war with the United States. And he won't have to wait long, for Admiral Nagumo's strike force is already a third of the way to Hawaii. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us well-fed on a busy schedule. Wednesday, December 3rd, The Oval Office. Roosevelt has been meeting regularly with Navy leadership. Japanese fleets are moving into Southeast Asia, but no one knows what the target is. One group of six carriers has simply disappeared. The general consensus is that Japan will strike Malaya, Hong Kong, or the Dutch East Indies within days. Some even fear that they're planning a surprise attack on the Philippines, though that's a minority opinion. Roosevelt then meets with the British ambassador and finally gives him the answer he's been begging for. If Japan attacks British or Dutch territory, America will support their fight. Later that day, Stanley Jones, an old friend of Roosevelt and a missionary to Japan, visits him, and in his pocket is one last gambit for peace, cooked up by Ambassador Nomura and Special Envoy Karusu, using Jones to get around the increasingly hostile Cordell Hull. Karusu wants Roosevelt to go over the heads of the militarists and cable the emperor directly, offering to negotiate an end to the war in China. Hull dislikes this idea. The FBI has reported smoke at the Japanese embassy. They're already burning documents. War could start any minute. Though, after considering, Roosevelt decides he will send the cable. One last chance at peace. And if he had sent it that day, it might have arrived in time to make a difference. Instead, he'll send it the evening of December 6th. Thursday, December 4th, Tokyo. For hours, Tojo's cabinet has been drafting a response to Hull's list of demands that we mentioned last episode, and the reply they're crafting is a 14-point statement of grievances, with the last one being the most crucial, saying America's position has made further negotiation impossible. It severs diplomatic relations with war inferred rather than declared. The foreign minister hates this. He insists the statement be delivered before the strike. The honor of Japan depends on it. Yeah, the Navy says they'll get back to him on timing. The timing of the attack is still secret, after all. And then, a full day later, they finally respond. The statement must be delivered at precisely 1 p.m. Washington time. They also say the foreign ministry should wait and send the 14th part, the one breaking off relations, until just hours before the attack. Saturday, December 6th, Washington. Dorothy Edgers is a Japanese translator in the Navy's cryptographic section and is working the weekend to catch up on magic intercepts. The program is understaffed, subject to Army-Navy turf battles, and, frankly, intercepts more than they can decode and translate. Now there's some low-priority messages out of Honolulu that need seeing to. Of course, those communications are probably mostly commercial rather than diplomatic, but she's not one to let things stack up. She sees one from December 2nd, where Tokyo asks about barrage balloons and torpedo nets, then a reply the next day about a German agent in Hawaii. Huh. But when the head of the translation section, Lieutenant Commander Alvin D. Kramer, arrives that afternoon, he isn't alarmed. Edgers is new to this work. He's seen stuff like this before. Japanese consulates monitor ship traffic at every port. He mostly nitpicks her rough translation, then decides it isn't good enough to pass on. Go enjoy your weekend, he says. We'll finish this up on Monday. Meanwhile, across town at the Japanese embassy, the first 13 parts of the statement start to come in. But there's a goodbye party for one of the embassy staff, and the senior secretary only gets partway through the decryption before he's pulled into a ping-pong tournament. And the history books don't tell us whether he won or not. But back at the Navy cryptographic office, Kramer now also receives the 13-point statement, intercepted when it was sent to the Japanese embassy. Recognizing its importance, he jumps up and not having a staff car, gets his wife to drive him to the White House. Reading the statement and its belligerent tone, Roosevelt then says, This means war. As emergency calls go out, with military officials being pulled out of theaters and called away from dinner parties, everyone in Washington now knows something's up. Sunday, December 7th, 
Around 8 a.m. Washington time, the 14th and final part of the statement breaking off relations and the instructions saying it must be presented to Hull at exactly 1 p.m. arrives at the Japanese embassy. And as before, it too is intercepted and Kramer gets a decrypted copy. And when he sees there's a delivery time specified in the instructions, his bad feeling gets much worse. Meanwhile, at the Japanese embassy, Nomura is freaking out. The decryption staff has all gone home to nurse hangovers, and it's 10 a.m. before he can get anyone back to decrypt the instructions. And that's when he finds out about the 1 p.m. delivery time. That is not enough time to work this document. He has to carefully translate this formal declaration to English before presenting it to Hull. <sighs> okay, panicking, he calls Hull's office. Can he please get a 1 p.m. appointment? Oh, sorry, sir. Secretary Hull has a lunch meeting. Um, could you possibly do 2 p.m.? No. He insists it must be no later than 1 p.m., and with that, gets the appointment. Nomura hovers over his senior secretary as the man, who can't type, mind you, it's more of a hunt and peck kind of action, translates the first 13 parts of the statement from Japanese to English. He finishes, but there are so many errors, it's nearly illegible. They start retyping the entire thing. Meanwhile, American leaders are frantic over the possible significance of the 1 p.m. delivery of that last ominous message. Why so specific? Was an attack imminent? Sabotage, perhaps? They send warnings to the Philippines and the Panama Canal, but weather conditions mean that Hawaii can't be raised. And with phone messages possibly being tapped, exposing the fact that the purple coat is broken, they instead opt to send a Western Union telegram. They forget to mark it urgent. At 6.30 a.m. Hawaiian time, at the mouth of Pearl Harbor, a destroyer spots the conning tower of a submarine. They sink it and then send a warning to headquarters, though it's dismissed. After all, jumpy captains were always mistaking driftwood or turtle heads for periscopes. Then, at 7.06 a.m. Hawaiian time, a radar unit picks up a wave of airplanes inbound. They call it in and are told not to worry. It's a flight of B-29s transferring in. They're just early. Meanwhile, in Washington, it's 12.30 p.m. and Nomura is losing his mind. It's only 30 minutes until they're meeting with Hull, and he's just been handed the decrypted 14th part breaking off relations. In addition, Tokyo has just sent corrections to the first 13 parts of the statement, and now multiple pages have to be retyped. They're going to be late for their 1 p.m. delivery. In Honolulu, civilians wake in confusion. Smoke rises over Pearl Harbor, and airplanes buzz across the sky. Okay, what idiot scheduled a big naval exercise on a Sunday morning of all times? Yoshikawa knows different. He rushes to the consulate just in time to hear the weather report. East wind, rain. Ten minutes after he's done torching his code books and all evidence of espionage, armed FBI agents break down the door. He raises his hands and identifies himself as a diplomat. Now, much later, he'll return to Japan on a diplomatic exchange, his activities not revealed until decades later. Rather, Japanese Americans, who he never enlisted as agents because he found them too loyal to the U.S., will be blamed instead. Washington, 2.20 p.m. Nomura and Kurusu enter Hull's office. They don't know that 15 minutes earlier, Roosevelt had informed Hull of the ongoing attack at Pearl Harbor, an attack neither diplomat knows about. Nomura stretches out his hand, but Hull does not take it. Instead, he flips through the 14-point statement and icily asks why it had to be delivered at 1 p.m. Nomura, apologizing for being late, says he doesn't know. And it's at this point that Hull launches into Nomura. In all of their dealings, he says, he's always been honest and straightforward. And you know, he'd hoped Nomura did the same. Yet now, here, he brings this statement full of lies and distortions. Then, Hull dismisses them. Nomura, still confused, reaches out his hand to shake once more. This time, Hull accepts. Then they exit the office into a mob of press. The next day, Roosevelt would use their late delivery of the statement as part of his Day of Infamy speech. A speech that created a clean, righteous narrative out of the complicated, multi-decade breakdown of American-Japanese relations. A story that began in the 19th century as two Pacific empires took their first tentative steps towards each other in a dance of imperial cooperation and collision, and a story that would be burned into the popular consciousness under three powerful words. Remember Pearl Harbor. Ah, Zozo, another completed history series for the extra history books. Say, when exactly do we have to start work on the next patron-voted topic of, uh, ooh, Frederick the Great, that's it. Oh man, that does not leave a lot of time to make a healthy dinner. Oh, thank you, Factor. 
Now, if you've heard me talk about HelloFresh, you all do know how much I truly love to cook, right? But the truth is that sometimes there are days that I just can't find the time. You know, like if I'm in the middle of something like a, well, I don't know, YouTube channel split, let's say been a lot of work. So what's a busy bean like myself to do, right? Frozen meals have way too many preservatives and never taste fresh, and delivery? Pfft, no, my bank account can't handle more than a few of those every month. So my solution is Factor, the pre-prepared meal delivery service that takes the guesswork out of my breakfast, lunch, and dinner with healthy meals that are ready to eat in two minutes. No prep, no mess. And because fitness truly does start with food, Factor gives you a ton of meal options to achieve any daily nutrition goals that you've set for yourself. Everything from keto, calorie smart, vegetarian, vegan options, and more, which you can choose from in their tastacular rotating weekly menu. For instance, as you can imagine, today was a busy one, but rather than eat something bad for me or skip lunch altogether, which admittedly I am guilty of far too often, instead I had citrus mojo Cuban pork. And I don't know if you can tell by the look on my face right now that I'm referencing that I shot for B-roll, but that smile's real folks, I needed that so bad. And not only did I feel great knowing it was healthy, it was so fast I was able to get a bunch of work done early, including this ad read you're listening to right now, which meant I had extra time to play with Zoe. So this busy New Year's season, if you'd like to eat better while being better with your time, all you gotta do is head to go.factor75.com slash extra credit 60. Then when you use the code extra credit 60 at checkout, you'll get 60% off your first factor box. Then not only will you be getting fast, tasty meals that fit your lifestyle, you'll also be helping out our channel in the process. Oh, wait, did I mention they had smoothies? Their smoothies are amazing. I'm actually going to drink one right now because, sorry, they're that good. Ah, ASMR deliciousness. Again, that's code extra credit 60 to get 60% off your first box at go.factor75.com slash extra credit 60. Well, shucks howdy there, Ahmed Zia, Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, and Skylar Holmes. Thanks so much for being legendary patrons. 